Welcome to another session on the management of fractures in children. In this session, we're going to focus on hip fractures in children. And probably ought to label this fractures of the proximal femur, uh, because that's really what this focuses on, the fractures involving primarily the femur. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of compare it with adult fractures. And so when I talk about things that we see in the adult, it will be in orange. And when we talk about things that are involving the pediatric, it'll be with a green background. So, how are fractures different in the pediatric age group from those of the adult? Uh, they're less common than That's the right. adult. That's right. They're less common. How's? Uh, the blood supply of the femoral head is different than the adult. That's right. So That's right. And so we don't we don't see as much avascular necrosis, which we'll talk about. And the fracture patterns are a little bit different. It's very common in the adults. You see it once or twice a month, maybe even more than that. And I've probably only seen about 30 in the 40 years that I've been in practice. We see maybe one or two a year, very uncommon. And we'll talk about when that occurs. But it's very rare, it's less than 1% that we see in the adult. And our treatment modality is certainly a lot different. Okay, so what are the primary fracture patterns that we see in the skeletal mature? What classification do we use? The Delbay and Cologne. That's right. Delbay and Cologne. And that's been around a long time. Uh, Colonna was a very famous orthopedic surgeon around the turn of the last century, the early 1900s, nobody really knows who Del Bay was. Uh, but this is the classification that's been done. And his classification had four types. One was a type one transphysia, the other was transcervical, number three was cervical trochanteric or base neck, and number four was intertrochanteric type. And those are the basic types that if you look at the fracture text or any articles, they focus just on these four types. And in my experience, there are two other types. Um, and this is the four Delvey clona. But there is that that occurs in the neonatal age, and there's also pathologic and stress fractures. And each one of these requires a little bit different uh, uh, management of the fractures. So that's why it's important that you classify these as one of the six classifications. All right, so let's look at the Delbay Colonna types. What's type one? The transficeal. That's right, it's transficeal. No, type two? Uh, transcervical. That's right, it's right through the neck of the uh, he, uh, proximal femur. How about type three? That's the cervical intertrochanteric. That's right. And it's really, a lot of people call this a base neck type of fracture. And type four again. The inner trochanteric. Yes, yeah, so that seems to occur in the inner trochanteric area. And so each of these requires a different type of treatment. So, what's unique about the growth areas of the proximal femur in the adult, in the infant, do you know? There are two centers. Well, initially though, what is it? Well, actually, there is a combined center that uh, the head and the greater trochanter actually have a combined center. It's not until they get older that it goes into two specific centers. So that's very important because the fracture pattern that we see, the weak area is at the physeal line. Now, as they grow, those centers become separate, but there is a thick band uh, that's kind of remnant of the original two centers together. There's a, actually a thick band that occurs and joins really the greater trochanter and the head and neck. And you can see that thick band. And we'll discuss in just a minute how that uh, can affect the fracture patterns. And it persists in the older child as kind of a thick band. Here's a good example. Because of this thick connecting band, the trochanter and femoral neck can actually fail as a unit. Even though they're separate, a little bit older, they're separate ossification centers, 
that band I've seen uh, where, and that's what happened in this patient, had a fracture, transcervical fracture, but also there was an avulsion of the greater trochanter apophysis. And the apophysis of the greater trochanter would attach to the fracture of the neck, and you can see that actually persists as an old, in the older child as a thick band, and you can see that the apophysis is a little bit displaced. Uh, as we talk about later, we usually kind of ignore that, but that's something that you need to understand that can occur. So, the real thing that makes them different is, of course, the blood supply in the immature hip. Remember, the blood supply does not penetrate the growth process. So, what do you see in the early infant? What uh, is the blood supply? The blood flow is mainly from the medial. Uh, yeah, but I mean, what's characteristic into the head? Is it that it's a retrograde? Yeah. Well, actually, what it is, the vessels. There's no barrier there, and the vessels penetrate into the head up to about four or five months. So, in a very small infant. It actually freely goes there into it. And so there's a really good blood supply in the small infant. Now, after they get to be about three years of age, what changes occur? I think with the, um, with the growth plate, it begins to obstruct the... That's the exactly blood. right, yes. Now we get two separate ossification centers and forms a true physio plate and this serves as a barrier. So how does the blood get to the femoral head? Um, retrograde? Well, yeah, yeah, actually, retrograde, but it goes around. It has to go around that physis. And there's very little from the ligamentum teres artery. So where are the blood vessels that supply the femoral head? Um. On the superior aspect of the neck? Well, are they internal or external? External. Yeah. They're really, they course within the capsule, but they also course on the surface of the neck. You can see they course on the surface of the neck. So what's significant about this anatomical entity or structure? Uh, if, it's, if it's cut, you can lose blood supply to the head? That's right. It makes them very vulnerable to trauma, which then causes what? Makes them vulnerable for what secondary effect? The intracapsular pressure. Well, that's one, and what's the other one? What happens in the head? The necrosis. That's right. So if you lose that, you lose that blood supply, since it doesn't penetrate the physis and goes around, you lose the blood supply to certain parts of the head, and so they get... So, we talked about that. Now, what is the blood supply to the head in the pediatric age group? Where does it come from? The main blood supply? The lateral circumflex artery? Not, well, no, actually it's the medial circumflex artery. It's usually a little bit more posterior. And so what does it end in? What's PS stand for? Uh, posterior superior. That's right. Posterior superior and PI? Posterior inferior. Posterior interferior. And actually, it goes along the neck and then it goes along the surface of the neck into the head, but I suppose these two, so it makes it very vulnerable. What about, you talked about the lateral circumflex artery, what does it supply? Does it supply blood supply to the head? Mm, I don't remember. It really doesn't. It, it actually just goes to the neck. And so, what's the significance of this? In, is, in, in your approach, maybe. Um, you're probably safe anteriorly. That's exactly right. Line. So it does affect the surgical approach because you're, you can actually go anterior, and if you injure the anterior uh, cervical, I mean anterior arteries, it doesn't seem to affect the blood supply to the head. So an anterior capsulotomy and getting approaching this for an open reduction is actually relatively safe. Now, let's look at each specific type in detail. What's happening here? This, this is a patient that was sent to me years ago by a very good orthopedic surgeon. He said, Dr. Wilkins, uh, I've got this child with a dislocated hip. And so I said, fine. He said, 
uh, it's a, but it's a little bit un unusual. It's kind of painful and a little bit swollen, but it fit all the criteria. The fact that this was in the inferior uh, uh, outer quadrant of the hip, the pro proximal femur. So that's the that's the one of the signs of dislocation of the congenital dislocation of the hip. But Shenton's line was broken. So when you get a frog leg lateral, it doesn't look too bad. But what's different about this than the DDH? What's different? The pathology is in uh, the physis of the femoral. That's right, I know, but clinical. It makes you superior. Well, they got pain and swelling, which you don't see with the normal dis dysplasia of the hip. And that's the real key. And so, where is this fracture? Through the physis. That's right, it's very good. It's through the physis. And this, initially, we did one, this patient, and we stabilized it post-reduction. And that was a little difficult to do because you couldn't show where the pins were. And um, it wasn't a very effective method. And actually, we took the pins out, and this is some of the residual. It had a residual coxa vera, and that probably will remodel them. What's the other deformity you might have with this? The distal pro fragment is externally rotated. What does that produce? Retroversion? That's exactly right. It produces retroversion. And that probably doesn't remodel as well. I remember rotational um, deformities don't remodel like angular deformities. So, this is the way you diagnose it. And what do you look for when you got it under the image intensifier? Is this hip dislocated or where is the uh, problem? What do you do to confirm that this is a fracture through the proximal physis? Well, what you do, you rotate the lower extremity and where does it move? In the acetabulum, the femoral head and the acetabulum? The distal portion of the fracture. Yeah, that's right. It removes right here in this portion. And so when you do that, you'll see the motion there rather than the hip coming up. So there's motion at the fracture line and that's what confirms it. So you see, this is a fracture of the proximal femoral physis. And this actually occurs before this child ossifies even the femoral head. So, how are you gonna manage it? We, we already looked at, it's very difficult to manage this. You can't put blade plates and you can't, it's difficult to see with pins and you wanna treat it non-operatively. How would you treat it? I think a spike cast? Well, that's a little difficult to see. Yeah, you can. But in this age group, it's a little difficult to put spike casts on. Actually, with our experience, we found that actually if you put it in a pavic harness, here you see in a pavic harness, that reduces it. And this course in this age is gonna heal, especially since it's the physis, it's gonna heal very, very rapidly. And so you put them in the pavic harness for about three or four weeks, and then you gradually wean them out of that. The pavic, in the pavic harness, you can see that the fracture is reduced. So, unfortunately, some of these will go untreated. What kind of conditions do you see this where it's untreated? Well, this is a patient that showed up where you can see it was untreated. And what is your suspicion here? Well, this is often seen in non-accidental trauma or child abuse, and this one showed up a month post-injury. It was a twisting injury that occurred. Parents said he fell out of bed, but that's not true. This is where he probably was crying and they twisted injury. And you can see it's going on to remodel. At about six months, there was some remodeling. There's still some retroversion, but the angulation is remodeled and the hip is kind of settled into the, the femoral head is reduced and the uh, metaphysis is kind of settled into a normal position. The next type is the transepiphyseal. And here is a transepiphyseal. And there are two types. What are they? Do you know? It's with the dislocation or without the dislocation. That's again, that's right. Without dislocation as of the head, the head stays intact in which there is a perfect, you know, a, a fracture right, a salt of Harris type one, 
or maybe a two right through the physis, but the head remains reduced. So this is a fairly easy one. All you have to reduce is the fracture. You don't have to reduce the head. But sometimes it can occur with dislocation. So what do you have to do? Reduce the head and the fracture. That's right. You have to, you have to reduce the fracture and the head. So that can be a little bit more complicated of the head. And here's a good example. This was a little bit older child, and this was seen by one of my colleagues. Often you see this, this is a little bit older, and you see that there is a separate fracture of the posterior wall of the acetabulum with this. And this, of course, was a very severe injury. And this was a challenging type one type of fracture. So what's your next step that you're going to do to determine the approach of this fracture? Is that fragment anterior or posterior? How are you going to determine that? Well, you need more imaging. What kind? Uh, you could do the frog leg. Well, uh, or, or, or you need a lateral at least. Yeah, is there um, another better way of determining that? Um, well, what about a CT of the proximal femur? All right, you got the CT. Where's the femoral head? It's posterior. Yeah. So how are you going to get that into the acetabulum? Well, it's tenuous. It's scary in a kid because we know the blood supply is there, that's so right. it makes it more difficult to think about. Yeah, you're um, going to do an open posterior approach or an open anterior approach. If you do an anterior approach, it's very difficult to go from here all the way to the back. Well, like I say, one of my associates did this. He was a really good surgeon. And so what he did was he first reduced the fracture. And he did that actually by rotating the femoral neck until it lined up with the femoral head. And once he did that, what did he do? He probably pinned the fracture. That's exactly right. He pinned the fracture. So now he's just got a distance dislocated hip and he stabilized it with cannulated screws and he's got stable, now he can just do it. And you have something to grab the head to push it back in. And so that's a, a little technique, a little trick that you can do if you see this. It's a pretty rare entity. Yeah. Fortunately, since he did a, a close reduction and did it promptly, this child came in a year post-op and there was no avascular necrosis, so it was fortunate. And that was the key to doing that. Type two transcervical fractures, what do you have in this one? What makes it different? Is it usually high energy mechanisms? That well, it, almost all children's hip fractures are fractures of the proximal femur are high energy. In the physis, how do you count? What happens if you cross the physis? Uh, you worry about the blood supply? Well, blood supply and what else? And then growth. Growth. Growth or rest. But here, what do you have across there in the proximal fragment? Well, you have some metaphysis. Now, in the adults, if you remember, usually the fracture line is along stress lines and you have jagged edges. So it, you can get impacted type of fractures and they're kind of intrinsically stable. As you can see here, this, this is sometimes will compress and get intrinsically stable, as you can see here and then you just stabilize it to allow early motion and mobilization by putting some type of internal fixation. But um, in the child, it's usually a result of severe trauma and it's not affected by the stress lines and the smooth surfaces and so it's less stable. Uh, you don't have a lot of intrinsic stability. So, it's usually always displaced, as you can see. So, what's the treatment here? Uh, First thing you have to do is what? Reduce the fracture. That's and right. The yeah, and, and often <coughs> you can reduce it by closed methods. And the big thing in the adult, you need to immobilize them early. It's, it's very difficult to put a spike of cast on an 80-year-old <laughs> patient. Um, I did that once and the patient didn't do well. So it's very difficult. So you need to, in the adults, you need to have them intrinsically stable that you can start early motion. But the pediatric age group, they actually tolerate a cast fairly well. And 
uh, the cast doesn't need to be on very big, but they will tolerate a cast, and they'll tolerate immobilization on a temporary basis. So, what do we use for fixation? What are the two things that you need to accomplish in this fracture to get a good get a good result? You need some stability. That's right. You need stability, and you also need probably a little compression. So first thing you have to do is what? Reduce the fracture. That's right. And then you need to stabilize. And if it's displaced, you may want to treat them open. Why? Uh, I guess to restore the normal anatomy. And what else? Blood supply? I don't think that matters. Well, no. Well, it does have something to do with the blood. Okay. So you can do an anterior approach. And what's the advantage of an anterior approach? You r relieve the intracapsular pressure? That's right. Well, that's one of them. And one of them is that it's relatively safe because there's no anterior critical vessels to the epiphysis on the anterior portion. And the other one is that it also allows to evacuate the hematoma. And we'll discuss in just a few minutes the significance of the hematoma. So here's a seven-year-old female fell out of the tree. What kind of fracture has this patient got? She has a trans cervical, cervical fracture. Yeah, you really can't quite tell until you get a reduction and examine him under anesthesia, her under anesthesia. So we did a re he was done a reduction, and then you do a pin fixation. And you want to do what you like to do. It's usually the advantage here is that you have some metaphyseal bone, so you can put compressive effects across here with partially threaded screws, and you put a little washer here so that you can provide some compression, which will ha hasten the fracture healing. Now, the vascular necrosis rate, no matter what you do, it goes in, it depends on whose series you see, anywhere from 15 to 40 percent. Okay, let's look at the type three, cervical trochanteric. And how are you gonna treat this one? What, do you, what are the principles in treating this one? Uh, reduction. Um, yeah, okay, you reduce it and you put a stabilizing screw in it. Is that all you need to do? What are the forces that are affecting on this? Uh, you're gonna have flexion, uh, flexion deformity from the psoas, and then Yeah, you're gonna have rotational deformity. forces. And how do you counteract that? Well, you put a second pin, what else is necessary? There you have to have two pins uh, or two points of fixation to prevent the rotation, which is caused by actually the abductor muscles posteriorly and the psoas anteriorly. So you have to do that. And avascular necrosis is very rare in the adult, but it still can occur in the pediatric age group. It's less 20 to 30 percent. Okay, now we get down to type 4 intertrochanteric fracture. And remember, on this one, you have a good intact wall. And in the pediatric age group, that's a pretty in good, strong, strong structure. In adults, it's not. It's pretty weak. It's pretty thin, especially in old ladies. But in kids, it's usually pretty. So you really uh, don't need to do anything on the lateral border because when you apply your screws, especially compression screws, usually it provides good stability. But what happens here, the type 4 intertrochanteric? Mm, the wall is not stable? That's right. Very good. Yeah. So you've lost that lateral uh, surface for the plane. So what do you usually have to do to... You, you probably need to reinforce it uh, with a plate or something. That's some, right. Some sort That's of, right. Uh, you really need to reinforce it and kind of uh, put the stress on it. And this is an intertrochanteric fracture that you see very commonly in the adult, but almost never see a vast necrosis associated with it. But it still can occur in the cervical, I mean, the uh, subtrochanteric in the pediatric age group. It's much less, it's only about 4%, but you need to tell the parents and, and warn them that you can get avascular necrosis, even with the best of treatment. So, how are you going to treat this? I'd use the proximal femur plate. Yeah, well, what you or can do 
Now, often these fracture lines are not just simply transverse, they're kind of oblique in the coronal plane, as you can see here. And so, as you said, you need a side plate that's necessary. And here you use a side plate, and you put screws above and below the fracture site. And what's this for? Those, uh, a lag screw? Yeah, that's right, because you have an oblique. You have to remember that you often have an oblique fracture, so it's not uncommon to have to put an AP <laughs> screw to compress the fracture that you see in the sagittal plane. Now, we're going through these four. Let's look at some of the unusual fracture patterns. Now, here's a really good challenging thing. You've got, what do you see here? Uh, it looks like there's two, two fracture sides. That's right, and what do you call that? It's a lateral fracture, and it involves what? The basis cervical. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I can't really tell until you get it reduced, but it's, it's certainly a, a cervical transcervical or basis cervical. What's the other fracture? Uh, transverse mid shaft yeah, diastole right. femur fracture. Yeah, and this is a patient that's about four years old. Now, how are you gonna treat it? Well, in the adult population, we fixate the femoral neck first and then uh, fix the shaft. Okay, so you can use, you can fix the shaft, yeah. And so you fix the neck first and then you fix the shaft, that's right. So, what's your plan of management? For the proximal fragment, I would use a uh, uh, two compression screws. Yeah, right. In the proximal fragment, you use screws. And so how are you gonna treat the shaft fracture in a four year? With, probably with flexible nails? Yeah, you can use flexible nails nowadays. Years ago when we did this, you can also treat them with just a spike of cast. And so you, once you stabilize the hip, you've got essentially an, uh, uh, an isolated femoral shaft fracture and you treat it with the basic principles. Nowadays we use flexible nails. It used to be that we used a, um, um, just trim in a cast and you can see that the initial fracture probably had some angulation and so what's happening here? Cast was wedged to correct oh, yes, the sir. angulation that occurred. Okay. So the RRF here, and then you treat this one with immediate spica, or nowadays we would use flexible nails, and you can run the flexible nails up to this fracture site. Okay. Okay, now some people will be very aggressive, and this is a more invasive process, and it's, you know, it provides some stability, but with femoral shaft fractures in children, you really don't like to do this. You don't need to go this. This is one that's a real challenge. This was osteogenesis imperfecta, and this was the old Bailey Dubow rods that we used to have the flexible rods that we did. And so this one, uh, it was a transcervical fracture, and so it was a little hard to get that screw over the, the proximal pin. You need to leave that pin in. And so sometimes they're kind of challenging and it's real soft. Now, let's look at pathologic fractures. What usually causes the pathologic fracture most common cause in the pediatric age group? Cryosteogenesis imperfecta. Well, yeah, but in a normal it's patient. A bone cyst? Yeah, very good. It's a mm -hmm. bone cyst. Now, how are you going to stabilize this one? Can you put a, a screw in this thin cortex? Mm. No, you can't. And so, how are you going to treat it? I'd be tempted to use flex nails or yeah, just Now that we can use flex nails, is there another method? Well, you can actually put them in 90-90 skeletal traction and you allow the cyst to heal, I mean the fracture to heal, and once the fracture is healed, then you come back and treat the cyst. Now, how would you define this patient's fracture? Here's so this lytic lesion on the left hip. Which yeah, is and what's characteristic of this lytic lesion? What's this sign called? That's the fallen bone, bone leaf. sign. Oh, the fallen leaf yeah. sign. Yeah. And what does that tell it? Non-ossifying. No, it's well, a UVC. Cyst. It tells you it's a cyst because when the bone fractures, it 
that fluid and it falls into the cavity. So, it's a pathologic fracture. So what's the main problem with this fracture? There's not a lot of fixation options. That's right. It's kind of length unstable. So how are you going to manage that? Uh, I may put it in a cast and then come yeah, back but and then it, do it. It'll, it'll shorten. Oh, traction? Yeah. So you're going to use traction. Now, is this what you proposed? You put them in 99 traction? You don't know uh, this because we don't put we don't treat them femoral shaft fractures in traction anymore. Yeah, external fixer. Okay, that's very good. Yeah, you know, you're not going to subject this patient to hospitalization. And there is another way. And how did you say that? External fixer. Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, put a you put a pin in the proximal portion and one in the distal, and then you. Get well, the, the proximal spanning. portion is the cyst goes all the way up to the greater trochanter. Or. You, you could even put something in the acetabulum. That's right. Well, you don't want to put it in the acetabulum. You put it in the super acetabulum. Or, yes, sir. And that's how this patient was treated. Very good. We went ahead and provided multiple pins in the acetabulum. And then you provide it here. And you, again, you hold it until the fracture heals and come back and treat the cyst. So this is another way that you can treat these um, at this point. Now, the result of a bone cyst fracture is what usually what can occur. You can get avascular necrosis. And here's another example that on the lateral view, avascular necrosis. And often you'll see bone cyst, and maybe they'll have a little crack and be a little uh, sore, an early stress fracture. But one of the things that you need to do is it's very weak, because if a cyst breaks in the proximal humerus, well, who cares? You're not going to have much in the way. It'll heal, and then you come back and treat the cyst, or there's different ways to treat the cyst acutely, but you don't have to worry about the, the complications. But if you get a cyst in the proximal femur and it fractures, you need to be a, you need to treat it immediately before it fractures and causes avascular necrosis. So all the bit, these are all the bone cysts. That's why they require aggressive treatment. So, let's talk about avascular necrosis. What's the overall incidence of avascular necrosis? Maybe 40%? That's exactly right. There's two series, the, the big fracture series. One is out of Hong Kong by Ratliff. It used to be that the British ran the training programs in Hong Kong. And this was a fellow, Ratliff, who had a large series over the years. And he had a 42% of avascular necrosis rate. Canale and Borland were at the Campbell Clinic and they had about the same, 43%. So, is, is it related to the degree of displacement? That's what I was told when I was a uh, resident, that more displaced, more chance of avascular necrosis. Is that true? Well, it probably has some effect but it's not the major reason, necessarily the major reason. And so, what is the role of a capsulotomy? To relieve the pressure from... That's right. But without a cap, and this is what they've come up with, you can see that the capsulotomy, with the role of a capsulotomy, without capsulotomy and aspiration, these are the series, 17 to 43 percent, and here we go, Canale, Rat, and, and Lamb. And Lamb came by and followed Rat, uh, Ratliff in, again in Hong Kong. But their more recent series is I guess, with capsulotomy, they had they decreased it down to less than 10 percent. And Jack Ching is the present director at, in Hong Kong. And then Song and Flynn and their king. In addition, the time to reduction and stabilization they found is a factor. The earlier you do it, the less chance you have of avascular necrosis. So, uh, without capsulotomy and aspiration, we talked about this and with this. So there is good evidence to show that a capsulotomy is useful, although that's, there's still some question about it, but it, I think the results show this. So, 
how is a rational necrosis manifest? What are the different types? Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's usually, sometimes it can be total. Both the head and the neck can be involved, like in this one. Here you had avascular necrosis involved in the neck, which went on collapsed, and you can see that screw has gone in across the physis, and avascular necrosis of the femoral head as well. Sometimes it only evolves the metaphysis. This is extremely rare, but sometimes it can only involve the metaphysis. And the most common ones, it just involves a segment of the epiphysis, as you see here. And this is very much like leg Perthes disease. And the other thing that can, can occur, and people have looked at these on long term, after one year they get, don't get avascular necrosis, but if they look at them after two and three years, it's not uncommon that you get just premature uh, growth arrest, as we see in this patient. So you see that there's a growth arrest with a shortening of the neck, which alters the um, hip mechanics because now you have a relatively coxivera and your abductor muscles are not as effective. Now, you do get coxivera, but where, where do you see that? What usually causes that? Usually with uh, inadequate fixation. That's right. That's usually what happens. If, if you just treat them in a cast without stabilization, the muscles like the psoas and the abductor muscles will come bring that proximal fragment proximally and actually kind of flex it up a little bit. And so you end up with getting a coxivera. And here's a good example. This patient was treated in a cast, um, you can see, and ended up with this type of deformity, a coxivera. And so that shows you that treating them in a the cast alone is not adequate. You've got to provide some kind of stability. Same thing that goes with non-union. And usually it may be secondary to inadequate reduction, or it may just occur from, we don't know why. And here you can see this patient had a good reduction, and this was the uh, post-operative view at about a week. And you, you would say that this has a good reduction you got compressive effect. These are the old screws before we had non-cannulated uh, screws, but it provided good compression and it seemed to be a stable thing. But this patient continued to have pain. And what's this? What's that sign? What's it called? Halo sign? No. You oh, have a car? And what happens when it rains? That's windshield wiper effect. That's right. It goes back and forth. So that tells you what? That it's loose. That That's it's right. Loose it's it. loose and it's, it's creating some lysis. And when you see that, what does that tell you? You're not healed at the... the it, it, that you've got motion at the fracture site so. and it's creating that. So that's the windshield wiper sign. And the significance is it tells you that you've got a delayed union or a non-union and it's not a stable construct. So... This is one that had that. You can see another advantage here. Also, what, why did this patient get avascular necrosis? Well, we do know if you put the pin up in the superior lateral portion, and this is true when you're putting pins in uh, subcapital femoral epiphysis, it can hit that lateral epiphyseal artery intraosseous, and it'll give you an avascular necrosis. So you want to put the pin inferiorly and avoid putting pins up in the superior lateral margin. Okay, now we got this patient that has a non-union. You can see that there's a little windshield wiper sign, non-union. So what are you going to do? Wait it out, put him in a cast. Put him I, I think um, you let the let let it ride and, to, and, and see. Well, you yeah, but if you let it ride, it's going to get more windshield wiper. That's true. Yeah. Well, how would you measure the delay in union? So you want to change it so that you have a compressive force, and so you can do a valgus osteotomy, and that changes it from a shear force to a compressive force. And often that's the way you rescue this, as you can see here. Now, this is a six-year-old male, post-operative, had a transcervical fracture. 
And they came back, <clears throat> actually this is after he's beginning to heal, and they came back at a year, and I said, we need to take the screws out. And the parents said, well, you know, he's been through a lot. We really don't want him to have any further surgery. And I said, oh, okay, but I, my recommendation is he take the screw out. Do you need to remove the fixation devices in a growing child? Yes. Yeah, because he started having pain about four years later, and you can see now, there's the fracture, and this is, this is a, a fracture that's about to happen. The reason he was doing that, he was beginning to get a stress fracture here. So you need to remove the screws. When you take the screws out, though, what do you have to do? Protect. You need to protect them in one way or another. You can put just a single head spiker cast on, or you can put them in a brace, because when you take this out, you've got a stress riser where the pin is, and so you still need to protect them. But you can see that. Now, we've gone through this. Let's see if you've learned anything, okay? We'll have some case presentations. Here's a 10-year-old who was unrestrained uh, in a motor vehicle accident. He was ejected from the vehicle, severe injury, and he only, fortunately, he was lucky. The only th complaint he had was pain in the right hip, and he was unable to bear weight. And he had pain on rotation of the left lower extremity, and he had no other medical problems. So, the, what do you see here? Uh, inner, probably intertrochanteric femur. Well, you really can't tell it until you reduce it, but this is either a transcervical or a base neck fracture. So what's your first thing you're going to do? You told me before. Uh, reduce this. That's right. So it's a fracture pattern. And so you place on a regular table, and here you have a, a um, uh, don't have quite a good reduction. So, what are you going to do? Uh, open it? Yeah, you're going to open it so that you can get it reduced, and there may be some tissue that's interposed in there. And then you, what do you do? Then we stabilize it with our cannulated screws. Yeah, right, and first you put guide pins in there to check it, and you stabilize it. Is that reduction okay? Uh, probably, once you get some compression. That's right, yeah. If you've got a little gap there, and you, with an open reduction, you want to make sure you don't have interposed tissue, so you put guide pins. And you make a little limited incision so you can look at it for two reasons. One, there may be interposed tissue. You want to check the quality. What's the other reason? You did a hematoma evacuation. Now, does that look like that's pretty well reduced, right? And so here you can see the fracture line. And this is a Watson-Jones approach that you can use. And what's the other thing that you'd accomplish with this? The hematoma evacuation? Yeah, the, the capsule is evacuated, opened, and so the hematoma is drained. So that will hopefully decrease the incidence of avascular necrosis. And you put partially threaded screws, and here again, you put a washer here so that you can provide some pressure. But in this type of fracture, this is probably a base neck fracture, so you need two screws, but here you have enough stability and integrity of the lateral cortex that you can apply compression. And here, with this screw, we put a washer. And so, or you can put a little plate on there to provide some uh, compressive effect. And this fracture was fully healed at two months. And we added a plate here for compression. So, what do you need after when you're when you sit down with the patient and he's got this fracture and you go over all of the complications what do you need to tell the parents about their risk of avn that's right you need to tell them we're going to do the best we can to get a good reduction and we usually think we can accomplish that without much problems but there's another complication which is avn that's right avascular necrosis and he got a good reduction, but here he was at six months post-op. What's happened? He has epiphyseal AVN. Yeah, he does. So that's what's developed. You can see that here. And here again, maybe it was due to the screw being up in that superior margin, 
but it probably was due to the fact that he had a fracture. So, how are you going to evaluate this? With um, an MRI? Yeah. So you do an MRI, and that's why you put titanium screws in there so you can do an MRI. And what does it show you? You've got it all around those two screws. Yeah, you got a large and area of necrosis, and what's happened here? The subchondral bone has collapsed. Yeah, that's right. It's soft and it's kind of squashed it out. You get this thing. And then you can do an arthrogram, but it doesn't really tell you much, does it? You see the edge of the labrum right there, but it doesn't tell you much. Other than the fact that this bump is in, in, impinging upon the lateral margin of the acetabulum, as you can see here. So, this patient has developed this. What kind of, what do you think his symptoms are going to be? Uh, he may have decreased range of motion. Yeah, that's right. Pain. Why? Yeah, uh, why? Because of that, um, that's that right. block he has. Uh, yeah, this is a mechanical situation. And here he is, and so you're abducting, and what does he have? He's got impingement. Yes, sir. Yeah. Here you can see you have limited hinge abduction, and that's what they call hinge abduction. Instead of rotating in the head, it comes in and actually opens up like a hinge. So it doesn't give you a good, and it impinges there, and so you have limited abduction, which causes pain. It's a painful situation. So how are you going to remedy this? Um, you can... He can only abduct about 10 degrees. Yes, sir. You, you can uh, open that up and... and um, well, you can take that piece out, yes, yeah, but that leaves you a lot of tissue, a lot of open tissue. Nowadays, some people will do that. You can do a salvage procedure and see that normally when you have this, you have very little in, you know, abduction and you got impingement. So you get impingement at about 10 degrees of abduction. So what you can do is that you take out a wedge and you do a valgus osteotomy. And so now this patient has more abduction before he impinges. And so he's going to increase his abduction. But he's probably going to need a, in the future, he's probably going to need a, a total hip because this will eventually wear out. So valgus increases the abduction before the impingement. Here's an 11-year-old thrown from a horse. What's this patient injury? He seems to have a left uh, either inter intertrochanteric or basis cervical yeah. femoral neck and an ipsilateral subtrochanteric. Yeah, so he's got two fractures. So how are you going to treat that? Uh, first fixate the femoral neck. And with, what else? And then, um, uh, depending on the age of the kid, uh, either intramedullary nails for the female. Yeah, so he's pretty getting Point pretty difference. close to mature, so you can use a this kind of fixation that you can see this. You don't use that kind of screw in a smaller child, but in adolescence you can see that. And he went on five months to heal. So, you know, I gave you the um, article by Dr. Beatty, who's pretty, um, um, has a lot, has a lot of experience. He's at the Campbell Clinic, and is a very, very good, uh, very well respected orthopedic surgeon, and this is what he says. He's pretty well summarized, and so I think we can use that. Fractures of the hip are uncommon in children, but their importance is related not to the frequency of the injury, but to the frequency of complications. There's a high instance of complications that we discussed. And many of these com complications can be minimized or avoided by prompt anatomic reduction and internal fixation. That's why if it comes in the middle of the night, that's one that you don't do the next morning, you do that night. Open reduction is frequently necessary to obtain a stable anatomic reduction. And he goes on to say, regardless of the age of the patient, stable fixation of the fracture must be given over preservation of the proximal femoral physis. So don't hesitate if you've got a short proximal fragment don't hesitate to get into the proximal femoral physis uh, because you, uh, you may get a little shortening, but it usually is not much functional significance as long as you have 
congruity of the hip and a good stable fixation. And the development of osteonecrosis, however, is most likely related to the severity of the initial injury. But, you know, there's really some other, <clears throat> and I've added this with the previous, Dr. Beatty wrote this years ago, and nowadays we see there may be some other factors, such as capsular evacuation and the type of reduction they have of the pain. And it's largely affected, unaffected by treatment of the fracture. Even though you do the best treatment, you still can get avascular necrosis because that occurred at the time of the injury. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm.